As you can see behind me there, I've got some mismatched socket fronts. I want to tidy them up and make them look the same with this nice socket front to match the USB one there in the corner. And there are some key things we need to do when we're swapping electrical accessories. So this is in essence maintenance. We're not installing any new cabling. We're simply swapping something that is already there. But we do need to ensure we remain safe. One of the key ways of doing that is checking that the power's off. So you can see this is the TIS 850 safe isolation kit. It's got everything in that you need from your voltage indicators, the locking devices, and also a proving unit. I'm going to run through how we find this circuit first of all within the distribution board I've got alongside this particular socket circuit in here and then how we make it safe to then swap it and I'll show you all of that being done and then some basic testing at the end. So if you're an apprentice looking to start changing the odd accessory here and there for your parents or family and friends or whatever, you must ensure that you're still working in a safe manner whilst doing even what can be considered the most menial tasks for an electrician. And equally, if you're a DIYer who feels reasonably competent and capable in terms of swapping electrical accessories, there are elements of safety you're going to need to follow as well. And we'll cover some of that through the course of this one. Let's jump straight to it. Okay, so one of the first things we're going to need to do is locate the circuit. So you can see here I've got the Klein Tools circuit tracing kit. This is the ET450. This one's spec to the American market, so I'm having to use some of my own adapter leads to plug it into a three pin socket outlet, but there are UK variants of this on the way shortly. Works really well, so we can see I've got the power on here. There's measuring 240 volts, 230 in brown book terminology, and we've got our DC signal been transmitted down that circuit. So if I take this receiver off to the distribution board, we should be able to locate the circuit we need to isolate. Obviously your consumer unit at home will be carrying labelling, but you do need to check that the circuit you've isolated is actually the one you intend to do so. So it's well worth checking, even if it's using a plug-in socket tester with the buzzer, so you can go off to the consumer unit distribution board, isolate the power, and then we can follow the safe isolation procedure to make sure there's no electrical energy here. So first up we need to turn on the circuit tracer receiver and set it to an appropriate level. I usually go for level three as a start point and then if we move it in to the top of the breakers and we slowly start moving it along, you can see we start to get some beeping and the gauge popping up. So we scroll along here, it's dropped away on that top one, it's peaking up again around that second one and then you can see it falls away again. So we're looking at these three here, 63, rising a bit 78, drops away. So we're looking like this second breaker down is the one we need to be um, isolating. So we can turn the power off there and go and see how that's affected the transmitter at the other end. And as we would have expected, we've now got that it's still transmitting, but there is no voltage present on this socket. Now that's not the end of the safe isolation procedure. This is just the first step in identifying the circuit. So we can now move forward and make sure we're in a safe state to carry out this socket swap. So before we get into doing any work, we need to understand the safe isolation procedure. And we've got this handy guide from Proteus. It comes in their lockout kit. So we're going to run through the 10 steps they've got in here. And it says, before you start, you need to get permission from the appropriate person. In that case, on this install, it is me. And I'm also the person carrying out the work. So that's handy. We then need to find our spot. So using, as we have with the Klein Tools circuit tracer, we can find out where a point of isolation for this circuit is. So we know how to go about performing the safe isolation. We then need to check our equipment. So we're going to look through the probes and this voltage indicator, make sure everything's in good order and that it's actually in Cal and everything. And we're then going to test it out. So we'll prove that it's operating on a known live source. In our case, the proving unit. 
We're then going to uh, make sure that switching off the circuit isn't going to cause any unnecessary inconvenience. So if the internet going off or the um, servers and such, that the users of the system are in agreement that that is okay. We're then going to make it secure via locking it off and making sure we keep hold of the key. We also need to attach warning labels to the lock off so people can identify that the circuit is intended to be isolated and they don't go restoring the power when they shouldn't be. We would then test the circuit to make sure there's no live voltages between the live conductors and earth at the access point. So in this case, our socket just behind us here. And we're then gonna check the instruments again to make sure that the batteries haven't gone faulty or something else has happened to them through the course of carrying out safe isolation and that we are indeed isolated as required because then we'll be safe to begin work. Let's get straight to that. So we found our spot using the Klein Tool circuit tracer and we're now going to check our equipment to make sure it's suitable for making the isolation. So we're going to check the leads on this TIS 8000 voltage indicator. This is the new one that will do both AC and DC. They're in good order. This is virtually brand new out the box. And we're then going to have a look and make sure that it will measure voltage by applying it to the proving unit. And you can see in there... We're measuring 770 volts DC. We've got the vibration going off. All the lights are illuminated. So we know that's operating. So that's our equipment checked out. We know that this is going to enable us to detect voltage. So the next thing we need to do is to switch off the circuit. Now you'll have seen I've already done that because we use the circuit tracer. I've turned the power off to this circuit. We're just proving that it is actually isolated. So next on the list is to make it secure. So we need to go back to the distribution board and apply a lock to make sure that no one else can turn the power back on whilst we're running through with these checks. So I'll go and do that right now. So you can see I've got this circuit isolated now. The RCBO cannot be re-energized. We've got the toggle strapped between the little holes. If you see on these ones below, there's some little holes in them. You just need to make sure you get them in the right ones because if you put them in the wrong one, you'll still be able to switch and operate it. So in this case, we've gone for as near to the um, reset switch as we possibly can. So we know that that cannot now be turned on. We've got our padlock through it and we've also got our warning labels. So there's this one here warning that the equipment is locked out and it shouldn't be operated. Same on the padlock cover. And on the other side of this, I can actually put my... Um, telephone number and the date the isolation was carried out so anyone who comes along to look at this has got a visual indication of what's going on if you're wanting to use a multi-lock you could use a hasp like this one here or like this one here and they would then go through your toggle so more than one person could apply the locks if you've got somebody who's in charge of the site as a whole they might want to know that nothing can be uh, re-energize without their say so because they're going to have a key for their lock and if you're the apprentice actually carrying out the replacement of a socket or accessory you can ask your employer to fit a hasp so you can put a lock on as well and be safe in the knowledge that nobody can re-energize that circuit without you also removing your lock so whilst you're not in direct control of the isolation you do have an element of control there and the thing to always remember is keep the key on your person so after we've applied the warning labels and the locks at the distribution board, we then need to come and check that there is no electrical energy at the point we intend to make access to the electrical system to carry out work. And you'll see I've got the voltage indicator down here. It's measuring no voltage. We're in between line and neutral. So we do need to check between all of the live conductors and earth. So we now need to swap over onto the CPC to line. And again, you can see there is no voltage there. And we can check also between the neutral and the CPC and you can see that there is no voltage there which is what we want to find and again we can just double check onto the line and the earth so we know in any combination that there is no electrical energy at this accessory but we've not finished just yet so the last check we need to do is ensure that the equipment is still working and you can see it is we've got the 750 volts been measured there it's still illuminating and vibrating so we know the voltage indicator hasn't failed through the course of our safe isolation and we've now got a safe way to swap this electrical socket with total assurance that there's no power here so we'll get on with that now and then i'll show you some of the things we need to do afterwards so with the isolation in place, you can see me here removing the socket front. We need to back the screws out from the back box so we can get access to the terminals on the back to disconnect the cable in so we can make that replacement. 
It is worth noting for the eagle-eyed among you that it is a C40 at the distribution board leading down to this office space where we then subdivide our circuits. So I've made my isolation there so I know there's no electrical energy coming into the office as a whole. I could have made the isolation at the local sub-distribution board, but in this case I opted to do the whole thing from the front, hence the size of these conductors based on the overcurrent protective device. So we now need to back off the CPC liner neutral from inside this socket front so we can release it from the cables itself and then we can start to look at how we're going to dress away into our new socket front. There'll always be a slight difference in the way the cables are connected into socket fronts unless you're lucky enough to be working with the same brand who kept the same configuration on the back of those sockets. But you can see me here just trying to dress the cables into approximately the right place. It is a slightly tricky one because there's a spare coming off this as well so we do also have to factor in an extra cable. You would normally find with a ring final the two cables into a socket point or on a radial you're likely going to be having the two as well unless you're lucky enough to find end of line where you would just have one cable coming into that accessory or even a spare itself where you would just again have one but in this case i've got three to contend with and they're all of varying lengths so i'm just making some adjustments cutting some fresh ends onto the cpcs because they look to have been over tightened and squished a bit much the first time around so we're just going to give those a fresh bed of copper for when we make our termination into the socket front you can also do the same with the lines and neutrals if you've got enough length and should you so wish, but these were in suitable condition to just dress straight away into these terminals. We were struggling on length with one of the cables in particular, so I didn't want to unnecessarily shorten them and make it more difficult than it needs to be for me or the next person coming along. Again, we're just tightening these up now. We've got them loosely into position so we know we've got a good solid connection. And at every stage, don't forget the tug test just to make sure they are tightly clamped into the back of the socket front. We don't want any loose connections. And then repeat the process with the neutral. So we're now gonna push that into the back of the terminal, making sure they go all the way in and we've got no exposed copper sticking out of the back. And again, we can screw that down nice and securely and make sure with a little tug test that they're in nice and snug. I should also say that these are not exactly the same color of circuit accessory while we're mentioning it. It's a slightly different shade and it's a slightly different manufacturer. This is the Apprentice One to One Academy and I'm donating bits of equipment that we've got left over from jobs to kit it out. This is the backdrop to my podcasting area and I wanted to make it look a little bit different and smarten it up ever so slightly away from the white plastic and the chrome mixture and I think it comes up okay in the end. So you can see there we've got the cables dressed into the box. We don't want to be squashing anything so we're not going to nick any of the conductors. We're not got anything over bent and we're not going to squash anything and compress it where it's not wanted. Even more important when you're using the metal flush boxes because if you get any nicks or cuts you'll be upsetting that RCD when you do get to the stage of turning the power on if you don't pick it up through the course of your dead tests. You can see we're getting the screws back now to the box and making sure we're getting those located into the lugs. You've got to be careful to not go off square with these because you can soon cross thread them and make them very difficult to then re-thread. So you can see I'm just taking a bit of care to make sure that they're going straight in nice and snug and we're going to go for the old north-south arrangement. Then using a little bubble level we can make sure we get this exactly straight so we know it's going to match through to the socket adjacent. And once we're happy that that's tight back to the wall, just make sure it's not got any pressure in any of the wrong places that the switches operate. Because once you've clipped the cover on, these are a bit of a nightmare sometimes to remove. So it's worth that extra check. So whilst maintenance doesn't necessarily need the same level of certification and testing as a new installation or addition or an alteration, I think it's very good practice to ensure you still do run through a full series of tests just to ensure you've not introduced a fault and you're leaving things in a safe state for the person using the installation. It's really quick and straightforward. I've already run through the dead tests on this one. I'm gonna do a quick loop impedance test here with you now using the TIS MFT Pro Plus. You see I've got power on on the socket. We'll zoom in onto the screen down here and we've got the voltage between line and neutral and voltage between line and earth. Now if I hit test, that should give us a value of impedance between both the live conductors, so live and neutral, and live and protective earth. So we know in the worst circumstances, if there's a fault, the overcurrent protective device will operate quickly before anything dangerous results. 
And you can see our live and neutral loop is a little bit lower than the live and protective earth. And that's because the cable on this final circuit is 2.5 line and neutral conductors and 1.5 mil for the CPC. So it's 2.5, 1.5 twin and earth essentially. So you would expect a slightly higher value of impedance because the CPZ conductor is smaller. But that's exactly as it should play out based on the dead test and the ZE we've got on this installation. So I'm happy with that. We can now run through the RCD tests and ensure that that's still operating as required and button this one up as a job well done. Okay, so I'm pleased with the result there. We've now got a set of sockets that match rather than the mismatch I had before. You can see if you're going to do things properly and go through the process of safe isolation as you should, then it's not quite as straightforward as you first think and there are some bits of equipment you're going to need. The TIS850 kit is fantastic because you get your proving unit, your voltage indicator and the lock-off devices. So if you're working in a small domestic commercial environment, that's going to see you through single circuit isolations or whole board isolations quite happily. As you work through your career as an electrician, you will build up a vast array of lock-off devices when you start getting into some of the big panel boards and stuff. It's a bit more tricky, so you're going to need various bits of gear to be able to do that. But that all comes with experience, because you also need to know how to operate and work around that equipment safely before you even think about isolating it. Um, I've got quite the collection now, a couple of tubs full of gear, and the daily driver stuff is pretty much what I've shown you through the course of this video. There is some more bespoke items that electricians will use for testing the circuits afterwards, as I believe you should be doing. So the MFT Pro Plus there might not be in the hands of every apprentice when they're swapping out a socket front at home for the mum and dad. So there are other options where you can use your voltage indicator to at very least see you've got polarity the right way around. You can use the plug-in socket detectors as well that will give you the nice illuminated um, good earth continuity. I think it measures between 1.1 ohms for the ZS and gives you a green light if you're in there which is the safe limit for operating a B32 RCBO. So those things are good visual indicators as well. But my recommendation is to run through a full test process when you're swapping out your circuit accessories. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video and there'll be links in the description to all this stuff from the uh, Klein Tools circuit tracer all the way to the Proteus lockout kit. So they give these away actually if you get involved in their online community and tag Proteus in posts, they will send these out free of charge to people who are doing that. And that's got the 10 step guide in there and the padlock key and little toggle lockout. And there'll be a link in the description as well to go off and check that TIS850 kit out. I don't think you can beat that for value anywhere else. It's around 100 quid less at some of the trade shows. So well worth getting your hands on one of those if you are starting out doing a few bits and pieces around the home, uh, your own house as an apprentice as a bit of practice. Getting into good working methods and staying safe is what it's all about. I hope you've enjoyed the content through the course of this video. If you've got any questions, please do drop them in below. And otherwise, I'll see you on the next one.